Hi, I'm Swathi Pandey, online editor of Zocalo Public Square. I'm here today with Joyce Appleby, a historian who's come to talk about her new book, The Relentless Revolution. Thanks so much for being here with us today. It's a delight to be here. So most of us think of capitalism as an economic system, but you describe it as a cultural system. Can you I discuss do. the two? I do describe it as a cultural system because it, without a supporting culture, capitalism cannot thrive. Isolated capitalist practices went against all the mores of traditional society. So it wasn't until the ideas themselves changed and people's habits changed and attitudes and, and mentality changed that capitalism could flourish. So what I say is that capitalism is a culture based upon an economy in which individuals invest their resources into making profitable goods, goods for a profit. When would you say capitalism began? It seems a difficult thing to pinpoint. It is a very difficult thing to pinpoint because something had to happen before capitalism could take off. There had to be a change in agricultural practices in order for there to be enough food to feed the population of a given society with fewer and fewer workers and less and less money. It was this incremental improvement in agriculture in the 16th and 17th century which led to an enhancement of the standard of living and then the key developments were a scientific breakthrough in which scientists uh, were able to s understand better the forces of nature and then very practical inventors use that new scientific knowledge to create artificial energy, the steam engine, the beginning of industrialization. Because capitalism did start, as you said, in England and the Netherlands, we, I guess we tend to think of it as a Western phenomenon? Yes, it is a Western phenomenon. Okay. To what extent is it a Western imposition or way of being? Uh, it's, it became very much a Western imposition in the 19th century, which is really mm -hmm. the century of imperialism, because capitalism, one of the things about capitalism is that it gives power and authority to individuals who have capital. Uh, they want their capital to work all the time for them. They want it to return a profit. So it looked as though there were profits lying in Africa. There were profits lying in Asia. If all they could do is move there and either co-opt co local leaders or impose their own authority and create, they produced rubber in the Congo and they produced diamonds in South Africa. Um, they they uh, commanded uh, cotton from India. And this was, as I say, was an imposition on the peoples mm -hmm. of the world who are not a part of the West. So capitalism is associated in their minds with imperialism and is a very bad thing. It wasn't really until after the Second World War that you had nations like um, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, earlier Japan, have their own indigenous capitalist revolutions mm -hmm. that you have countries outside the West becoming important. And of course, I include the United States in the West. You know, it's not in Europe, but it is certainly a part of the, of the West. How did cultures change when capitalism went to the East, especially post-war? Um, well, Eunice, what's interesting to me is that it, it shows the dominance of culture is that while they adopted capitalistic systems and their peoples had to adopt some attitudes and habits necessary for capitalism, they maintained a lot of their traditions. So what we have is dozens, hundreds, you might say, of capitalist cultures around the world. If you look at Japan, Japan is not like the United States, but it's certainly a capitalist society with, a, with now the second or third largest economy. Same thing is going on with China and India. They are becoming capitalist in their practices, and their attitudes are changing, but not totally. I mean, they're not becoming mirror images of the West. They have their own capitalist culture. You mentioned sort of oppressive regimes. Does capitalism require a democracy, and, and where does China fit into that? No, I don't think. I think China demonstrates to us that it doesn't. But you know, we're not through with China yet. <laughs> China has had started its reform program in 1978. In the in the life of a nation, that's not very long. And we see now that struggle with Google and China over censorship. Now they can, they can squelch Google, but it's going to hurt their entrepreneurs who need that instant information. So I don't know. It's very interesting. India, may, India which is a very old democracy now, mm -hmm. um, may show that they have a better way to a capitalist society than China. But both of them are the big winners of the of the 21st century so far, and it's, to me that's just fascinating. 
I, you know, the idea that that you'd have countries that large that wouldn't be also wealthy. It's kind of offensive rather than wanting to see everybody be poor in the United States rich. I think we should be mm -hmm. very happy about a future in which there are a lot of wealth generating countries. Is there a particular American model of capitalism and yes. where do you see that in the future? Particularly there, with there is, media? there is. I think that the, the meltdown of 2008 shows the downside of the American economy. The American economy is, has been much more innovative and has had a what much weaker safety net. Now from the economist's point of view, they're connected. They say, you want a rich safety net, then you have high taxes, then you make it difficult to fire workers, uh, then you have all sorts of excessive s safety concerns, and you're not going to have innovative startups because they can't afford to do these things. If you want the innovation, then you have to have a, a free, free flow. I'm not sure that's true. It, I think it, I think it has been true if you compared Europe and the United States after the Second World War. You see that Europe went for a thicker, sturdier safety net, and, and they were able to use the innovations of the United States, though not, they didn't have the first go at it, so they suffered a bit beyond the United States. But I think now, I think we're wise enough that we, that we don't have to make that trade-off. We can invest more in our own society. The period that was most prosperous in the United States in its history is the 25 years after the Second World War. And at that time, government took a very strong lead in providing education for a million GIs, in providing unemployment, providing help in housing, Levittown, San Fernando Valley was built at this time. Government was involved in research and design and, and led to the, leading to the development of the computer. And so there was a tremendous amount of government involvement, and yet it was a dynamic period. So I don't think the two are incompatible. We just have to find the right balance, and there's no reason that we can't.